record. And we are live. So uh, it's week five, and we are going to talk about engaging and supporting students in learning. And actually, the I guess the actual topic is uh, going to be raising rigor, increasing complexity, so that your students learn more. So I'm gonna, we've, we've gone over how to design a lesson. We've talked about uh, teacher-centered instruction through lesson planning. We've talked about student-centered instruction through project-based learning, performance tasks, inquiry, things like that. Um, tonight, we're going to really drive, jump into taking those lessons you create and how do you make them better? How do you increase engagement, um, maximize learning, increase complexity? And one of the big words, buzzwords that you should all know as you go into interviews is rigor. How do you increase rigor? So here we go. Tonight, we we'll gain a general understanding of strategies designed to promote a deeper and more complex understanding um, by learning about Bloom's taxonomy, Webb's depth of knowledge, and the SAMR model of technology integration. <clears throat> the four TPEs that we're going to be really addressing tonight are making it comprehensible, making it accessible, student engagement, TP number five, and then developmentally appropriate practices and teaching. So, this acronym GIFT stands for good instruction the first time. If you've heard of uh, response to intervention, RTI, which I know we had our first week, we had a case study on RTI. Um, so there's three tiers or sometimes four tiers of the response to intervention model. The first tier, which is where all students are, is this is where I put the gift, right? So every student should receive great instruction, good instruction right off the bat before they start moving up the tiers of intervention. What happens is a lot of times in whole class instruction, when we talk about not differentiating, some of our kids aren't, aren't receiving the highest quality instruction they can get because they can't access it. And so how do we provide every student with high quality instruction um, that they can all access so that they get it in the first tier of instruction, right? So they're not getting it in a pullout program or an intervention because it'll be inevitable that they'll go to intervention if uh, they're not getting quality instruction when you teach. And it's through differentiation, it's through changing your lessons. Remember we differentiate content, process, and product. So you're gonna be differentiating those things as you design your lessons. The big three to think about when you're providing high quality instruction. One, classroom management. This is, this is the, the core of good teaching. If you can't manage your students, then it's going to be very difficult for uh, students too. One, stay engaged. Um, if you've got one student who's off task, then other students in class are going to be less engaged because you're going to be either not responding to them, trying to ignore behaviors, and they're going to be disruptive, or you're going to be responding and not teaching. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit. And I know that in 510, you talk about classroom management. So uh, instructional strategies, the way you deliver your lesson, your pacing, um, your sequencing, uh, anticipating problems, all those things that we've talked about during week three, uh, student engagement, right? We, want, we, we don't want learning to be voluntary in our classrooms. That means how do we get, make sure every student answers every question every time? Well, you use TAPL, right? Teach, ask a question, pause, pair share, pick a non-volunteer, listen, and echo or explain, T-A-P-P-L-E, TAPL. And that's, that's high quality student engagement, right? So you ask, you uh, teach, of course, your content, then you ask a question, pause, give them time to think, and you pick a non-volunteer. Don't pick a non-volunteer, then ask your question, right? Because then you don't have high engagement. Knowing what you're teaching and preparing good lessons is usually a big, big deal. <laughs> I uh, can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, seventh grade math teachers who really don't understand the content themselves. Um, so they're never going to be able to teach it very well. So you really have to have some content knowledge. So we'll talk about Bloom's taxonomy because what happens when you have low content knowledge, you're going to be in the bottom level of Bloom's. And so that's what you're going to get from your students. If you are a high content knowledge type teacher, you could possibly get your students to the higher level of Bloom's. Same with webs, and then SAMR is a little different. We're going to talk about using technology in a way that engages more students and increases learning. So managing your lesson. At the beginning of the lesson, you have to get their, their attention, right? So we have lots of 
great attention getters. That should be, that's teaching 101. Uh, one, two, three, eyes on me if you're in an elementary school. Uh, class, class, yes, yes, different things like that. Um, you want to always have something that can get students' attention and get their eyes on you. State the objective. We are here today to learn something. Here's what we're going to learn. You're going to learn this by, remember that by statement. What's the essential question? What are we, what, what, what's the question we want to make sure we answer? It should be aligned with your objective. Activate prior knowledge. We talked about how important that is, right? When we talked about week one, making those connections in the brain, you have to be able to tap into things that they know so they can connect. And the anticipatory set, getting that hook, right? Why is this lesson important? Why is it relevant? Why do I need to know this? And managing in the middle of your lesson, considering the following, your transitions. Are you moving students from one area of your room to another, from sitting to standing, from one activity to another? Make sure those are smooth. Those should be less than a minute long. If, you're, if they're not, you're losing valuable instructional time. Your pacing. Are you teaching too fast? Are you going too slow? Students are going to dictate your pacing. How often are you referring back to that objective, right? It's like going back to the anchor. Remember, that's why we're doing. Here's what we're learning. Do you think we're on the right track, everybody? Good. Uh, and then checking for understanding. Is everybody, everybody getting this? Uh, getting a, you know, whiteboards is a great way to check for understanding. You can look around. Thumbs up, thumbs down are okay. Most students can lie if they, if you don't have a, you know, a, a place where they feel safe to make mistakes. Um, so whiteboards are always good. And then there's a lot of uh, computer programs, your Google Classroom, things like that, where you can check for understanding. Kahoot is a way for checking for understanding as well. Input model, we talked about that, right? That's I tell and do it. You respond, watch, and listen. This is where I do metacognition. I'm thinking out loud. I'm, I'm working through the problem or what I want you to learn, and I'm showing you how I want you to do it. Structured practice, perfect practice. We're going to do it together. You're going to kind of help me. I've already modeled it for you. Maybe I've already put up a step chart. So it shows step one, step two, step three. Now you're going to tell me how to do it. Why are you telling me how to do it? Because I know that I'm going to do it absolutely perfect. So I can't make any mistakes. That's why it's very structured and it's perfect practice. And then guided practice. You're gradual releasing through the whole thing, right? You're taking, you have all the ownership in input model, most of the ownership in structured practice. Now you're giving up some of the ownership. We're all going to do it together and I'm going to guide you through it, kind of flipping structured practice around, right? So you're the ones doing it, but I'm going to walk you through it step by step, okay? And guided practice could be more than one problem or more than one uh, model, right? So you could do it as much as you want and you can gradually release more responsibility or more practice to them until you feel like they're ready. Uh, well, that's the same side. Check for understanding during this whole thing, each stage. End of the lesson, closure. Did they meet the objective? How do you know? Did 85% of them, that's always been my magic number, 85%. Independent practice, it is still practice, right? You're not letting them do it on their own. Did they answer the essential question? That should be your assessment. And then after the lesson, still very important, right? Kids are gone. You need to assess, you need to look at the data, you need to reflect, how did you do? What would you do differently? Were your questions rigorous, rigorous enough? Did you get what you wanted from them? Adjust your lesson. Reteach if necessary. So some classroom management tips, strategies that prevent misbehavior is just with itness. And this is a tough word to define, but you probably know what I mean. You probably remember teachers that were just with it. You wouldn't misbehave in their classroom because they just seem to be on it all the time. And they kept the class moving, right? So usually kids are misbehaving when they're bored, when they're disengaged. Um, and that's where that withness comes in. You have to have a well-planned lesson. Uh, proximity. While you're teaching, if it's input model, you're walking around that classroom. If somebody's talking, just go stand next to them. You don't even have to say anything. Stand, put a hand on their shoulder. They will, they will turn right into it. They'll be engaged. It's a way where they won't disrupt your teaching, but you're responding to the behavior. Uh, reinforce positive behaviors. When you see students doing exactly what you want them to do, this is PBIS or positive behavior intervention support. Um, when they're doing exactly what you want them to, make sure that's what you're drawing attention to. 
uh, management moving throughout the lesson. So your momentum, uh, your engagement, your rigor, how smooth you are in the presentation, all of those things will um, contribute to your classroom management, the effectiveness of your classroom management. And then maintaining a group focus. Make sure you have group alerting, group accountability, and high participation formats. How can you get more students involved? All students involved. That was always the mantra I use, still do, is every student, every question, every time. The thing is, is uh, good classroom management managers aren't always good teachers, but good teachers are always good classroom managers. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Bloom's taxonomy. This is the revised one. Um, you can see that bottom of the pyramid here. You have the knowledge or remember stage. This is just where I can recall, right? Low level of understanding. Um, the capital of California is Sacramento. Everybody, what's the capital of California? Sacramento. Great. So that's lowest level. That's, you know, DOK1, um, Bloom's Taxonomy. Understanding, being able to describe and explain something. Tell me about Sacramento. Where, what may, why do you think people settled in Sacramento? Well, because it was access to the river, which accessed the Delta, which accessed San Francisco during the gold rush. So now there's a deeper level of understanding. Application, if you were to build a city today, you know, type thing, and you needed access to San Francisco, where was another location? Vallejo, there you go, great. Analyze the problem, evaluate, create. So you see how it just keeps getting deeper and deeper in the level of understanding and what students need to know about the content and the topic, the higher you go up in the pyramid. And again, that top stage is being able to create, right? Can they create something? Can they teach something? If they can turn around and teach a lesson, on what they've, uh, what they've been learning, that's one of the highest levels that you could achieve of understanding. Here's some great question stems to consider that line up with blooms, uh, including some verbs, right, and some activities. So you can go ahead and like do a control print screen on your computer if you wanna save that. Um, this is a great thing to access as well. So I'll keep it up there for a second. See the different, um, those question stems, right? So who, what, when, where, why, describe what is, is level one, look at level six. Do you agree that blank? Explain your reasoning. What do you think about blank? See, this gets a lot of inference and opinion. Prioritize blank according to, and give them something to prioritize based on. Um, so really good stuff, there you go. All right. This is a very fun activity. This is one of my favorite little websites that I discovered a few years back. So we've talked about creating objectives. Um, since there's only five of you in class tonight, we're not gonna break out into groups. We'll just do it together. But uh, go ahead and type in this website or copy and paste it. And I'm gonna take us there as well. Keep it up there for a second. Oops. Go back. All right. Let me turn off the chat here, remove it. So this is a great, this is called the differentiator. So this uses Bloom's taxonomy, Kaplan and Gould's depth and complexity, Chung's product menu, and you can use it in different languages. But, so let's think about um, one, students will, what do we want them to do? Here are the levels of blooms, right? All across the top, remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. I want students to, uh, I want them to criticize the, let's pick the content. The, I want them to criticize the change over time of the, and this is where I can add content if I choose to. I want them to change over time of um, let me see who is, uh, what was the girl's name in Charlotte's web? I forget. Anyway, we'll call her Betty. Just cause I can't remember. I haven't read that book in a while. The change over time of Betty from Charlotte's web. Is that not it? I doubt that's it. Somebody knows. Fern, thank you. Thanks, Heather. Probably, 
using, what do we want them to use? So we're going to ask them to use the product or resources using, um, well, we're obviously the library book, Charlotte's Web. Oh, why did that? Using a library book and create uh, what? What do we want them to create? Um, I'm going to have them create a uh, just a timeline, right? Since we're talking about change over time, and I want them to work in groups of two. So there you go. Check check out that uh, that objective, right? So you this the, because you have this built in, right? Especially the thinking skill. You can build in the, the rigor using Bloom's taxonomy of your objective. Yeah, this is really neat, Angie, absolutely. So I want you to create one. I want you to, uh, I'm gonna go back to um, our Zoom or my PowerPoint. There we go. I want you to create an objective in the differentiator, and I want you to write it in the chat using this standard, RI, reading information, eighth grade, number six. All right, so you gotta look that one up, look up that standard, deconstruct it into one objective, and use the differentiator. All right, give you a few minutes and just post it in the chat once it's created. How are we doing? How much more time do you need? There we go. Let's check these out. Students will discuss the big idea of the author's point of view using a textbook and create a graphic organizer in groups of two. Perfect. Students will demonstrate the significance of the author's point of view using a library book and create a poster in groups of two. Excellent, David. 
All right. Hopefully Angie and Heather and Angie's there. Sorry, you already got yours, Angie. Heather and Michelle and Murphy. The good news is, is save this because this is going to be your attendance question, basically, is to create a uh, an objective in the differentiator. So save it, email it to me, boom, you've already been marked as here. So good job. Okay. All right. Thanks, Heather. No worries. Then we'll keep moving. Here we go. So now we talk about Webb's depth of knowledge. And we, we kind of touched upon this one a couple weeks ago um, where it has the wheel, right? Four different levels of uh, complexity, right? And so we can see that um, here are some questions that align with Webb's DOK. So it's kind of blooms, but it's condensed, right? So there's seven levels of blooms. There's four levels of depth of knowledge. And so that's, I, I kind of like to use Webb's depth of knowledge a little bit just because it, um, it's a little more succinct. Um, but I like blooms too, because I mean, it's been around forever. Um, so if we are to use Webb's depth of knowledge, to increase the complexity of a lesson. Here's what we might do. So here's an example, right? If the topic that we're teaching is healthy eating, um, DOK1, uh, I might say, all right, I need you to um, involve recalling a fact such maybe name a food group, right? Everybody name a food group. Type it in there. What's one of our food groups? Proteins, good. Fats, grains, right? Fruits and vegetables. Okay, so that's that's a food group. Do you do you have to have a, a high level of understanding of healthy eating to know that? No, it's a pretty basic understanding. So let's increase the complexity a little bit more with DOK2. If I were to show you the food pyramid, it's the pyramid now, or no, it's a plate, right? And one of them was missing one of the food groups was missing and I would ask which one, or actually show you a plate of food and ask you which food group is missing from this meal, would you need a higher level of understanding to answer that question? Absolutely. DOK3, how about if I have you cite some evidence that a lot of teenagers have poor diets? Do you think you could research that and find evidence that a lot of teenagers have poor diets? Yes, and how would what would what else would you need to be, need to be able to answer in order to cite that evidence? You need to know what a poor diet is and a good diet is, right? Okay, so again, we're increasing complexity. I'm having you research. <laughs> yeah, gamers, and then DOK four. How about this? Design a campaign to improve teenage eating habits. Do you need to have a strong understanding of healthy eating? to do that, right, a whole campaign, and maybe even have you present it to the student body, right? See if you can convince students to be uh, more healthy in their eating habits. So again, take this same topic, DOK1, it's not bad, right? That's not a bad activity, it's just you're done in five minutes and you're moving on to the next lesson. DOK2 increases the rigor, three, four, so on and so forth. You can see that kind of where Bloom's is kind of embedded in here, right? It's recalling and remembering a DOK1 and you're creating a DOK4. So let's play with that ourselves. Let's think the water cycle. What's a DOK1 activity if the topic that we are learning is the water cycle? And you can go ahead and turn on your mic and answer if you want to. We can start by um, stating where water is being collected. Yeah, just do what's one one what's one component of the water cycle, right? Where, where does water accumulate? Reservoirs, all right? Or um, how does it accumulate? You know, through through evaporation, right? So that's that's you know we, we're starting to we know a little bit about the water cycle. What's a what's a good DOK two activity? Go ahead and chime in on the on your speaker. Anybody? Bueller. Okay, DOK2 activity. What if I, you know, um, took out 
it showed a whole picture of the water cycle, not to be redundant, but took a whole, you know, the whole picture of the water cycle or a poster and removed one of the stages and asked them what stage is missing. All right. DOK2. DOK3. Uh, Scott, would something uh, like, um, how, like, for example, the question, how, how would you modify a reservoir to retain more water? Would that be something more of a DOK3 or 2? Let's, let's take a look. Let's go back to our, our uh, I think that's a great question, right? So think about this. Let's look at this one. Where do you think that would fit, David? How would you modify a reservoir so that it retained more water? So probably three. Yeah, right? Where at? How can you use it, right? Yeah. What's the cause? What's the effect? What would be the reason? What's the result? That answers all those questions. That's an excellent question. Good. You're on the right track. So how about how have people negatively impacted the water cycle or just lots of you can kind of kind of get the drift here and then what would be a good dok for you know we're talking creation here on the water cycle what do you think this one's always it's always harder to design it takes a whole lot more thought in designing a lesson at a dok4 level maybe you could have students plan a water com conservation campaign Mm -hmm. You could do a campaign on water conservation in, in your own school, right? Or take a look at the infrastructure and see if you can improve it in any way. Perfect. That's real. That's relevant, right? Because you're talking about your own campus. That would be really good. Anybody else? Do you think students, what, how about the level of engagement? What do you think students would be more excited to participate in? Creating an art design. Sure. Why not embed some art here, right? Why not? Why not have a, uh, um, you know, have students do something that shows off their creativity if that's you know, something that they enjoy, right? Remember we talked about that in week two and knowing our students. We can differentiate the outcomes, right? We can have students be that could be one way. They, yeah. They can have. They can create a, a film, a flip graph, or a film. What do they call the flip grid? Yes, flip grid, yes. Yeah. yeah. They can yeah. conserve water or the yeah. Excellent. And have other students vote on them, YouTube videos, so we can go on and on, right? So I just want to get your brains starting to think at that higher DOK level, right? When we're on the fly and I'm right now, if I'm creating lessons for tomorrow to teach, I'm going to probably be DOK one or two. But if I'm really thinking out my, my units of, and my lessons well ahead of time and I'm putting in the time, I can create some pretty dynamic lessons that engage students in some really rigorous and relevant learning. All right, so this is the attendance activity. Um, all you, I'm gonna let you five, since you were here tonight and on the night that you didn't have to be here. Uh, thank you for being here, by the way. Uh, you can just submit the one that you already did. Uh, the rest of you um, that are listening to this recording, make sure you go to the birdseed.com differentiator and use that um, that standard and create an objective. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about is SAMR. SAMR um, is kind of think of a ladder that goes upwards. I have a great visual that I'll, I'll share with you in a second. On substitution, that's what the S stands for, substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. So it's, it's how do we use technology in a way that is improving learning, right? We got all these computers over the last 10 years in classrooms, um, but really all we've done is substitute worksheets for computers. Think about it, you walk in the classroom, kids are glued to computers doing what? Well, the same thing they used to do on worksheets. You think that's really changed or increased the amount of learning? I, I doubt it, right? We wanna start really looking at going towards that R. We wanna redefine what students are doing and learning um, through technology integration. This is something I'm very passionate about. But here's a, um, we're gonna watch a quick video so you can start to understand this. Let me move these out of the way so we can see our video. And then I can't. Hold on, what happened to my, uh, 
my video took me to something else. Sammer. Wow. All right, I'm going to just have to find a better one. Uh, this is the one I like right here. It's Common Sense Media. Okay, here we go. Every day, teachers are designing activities to target higher order thinking skills in order to engage students in rich learning experiences. But integrating technology adds a whole new layer to teaching and learning. How can technology transform your learning design? Dr. Ruben Puentadura developed the SAMR model as a way for teachers to evaluate how they are incorporating technology into their instructional practice. You can use SAMR to reflect upon how you are integrating technology into your classroom. Is it an act of substitution, augmentation, modification, or redefinition? Dr. Puentadura likens his model to moving up a ladder. The model includes a dotted line that represents the threshold where you shift from using technology to enhance learning to using it to transform learning. Transforming learning promotes higher order thinking skills, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating which are essential to common core state standards and 21st century learning. So, how can you teach birds, above the line? Let's take a look at an example of a classroom task and how it evolves through the lens of SAMR. In substitution, technology acts as a direct tool substitute with no real functional change to the task. For example, take creative writing. What if you had students write a story using a word processing program? In this case, Students are substituting a handwritten story for a typed story. The task is the same with no real change in student engagement. In augmentation, technology still substitutes, but before we move forward, so don't don't think just because something's at that substitution stage that it's inherently bad. Would we rather have students typing their stories on a word processing or a Google Doc or something like that rather than handwriting them? Yes, I mean, there's some, there's some things that help, right? We could save our work, uh, spell check. There's little things that, that that's, it's better to have, you know, teachers having, mo and I can't really think of too many teachers that aren't doing this, except for maybe some that are like dinosaurs. But, um, you know, substitution isn't a bad thing. That's a good, that's where we want to start. With some functional improvement, what if you took the same creative writing assignment and had students use a word processing program? They could use features such as spell check and tools for formatting. Again, the story writing task is the same, but the technology augments it with enhanced productivity. In modification, technology should allow for significant task redesign. Take the same creative writing assignment and have students use Google Docs to write their stories. Students can then share these stories with peers and provide real-time feedback. Here, technology has significantly modified the original task by introducing the benefits of student collaboration. At the top stage, and redefinition, technology allows for the creation of entirely new tasks that were previously inconceivable. What if students transform their written stories into multimedia productions? After creating storyboards, students film scenes, edit clips, and add music. They can publish the videos and receive feedback from voices across the globe. In this case, technology redefines the story writing task to include media creation, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So, how can you use SAMR to reflect upon transforming your learning design? Puentadora offers reflection questions to help you move up the SAMR ladder and shift how you are designing learning experiences. For instance, ask yourself, what will I gain by replacing the older technology with the new technology? Have I added an improvement to the task process that could not be accomplished with the older technology at a fundamental level? Does this modification fundamentally depend upon the new technology? How is the new task uniquely made possible by the new technology? These are just a few of the questions you can ask yourself as you evaluate the design of a classroom task 
and consider that not all technology integration is created equal. Ultimately, SAMR can help you evaluate your use of technology and design tasks that target higher order thinking skills, engage students in rich learning experiences, and impact student achievement. All right. So, what do you think about SAMR? Does that make sense to you? Good. So let me make it even more comprehensible for you. This is one of my favorite slides here. So let's talk about SAMR in a Starbucks uh, way, right? So S, we have just a regular cup of coffee, right, at, at Starbucks. Now, a cup of coffee at Starbucks, if you're getting a dark roast, it's, that's, it's better than Folgers, right? So you've substituted the original Folgers uh, with just the same thing, but at Starbucks, right? So it's just a little better. You've augmented your coffee by adding a little froth, a little milk, and so now you have a latte. But really, it's still the same thing. It's a cup of coffee, right? Now we're moving, again, across that threshold, and we're going to just totally trans uh, transform what we're talking about. So we have a caramel macchiato. Still a cup of coffee, but now we've got some vanilla syrup, a little caramel on top, and it's rocking your world. And then you just redefine the cup of coffee with the pumpkin spice latte. Can I get an amen? It's almost pumpkin spice latte, folks. Time, right? Another month and a half or so. Okay, so if you didn't understand Samer from the video, I'm sure you have a strong grasp of it now. All right, so we are actually done for this week. It's 36 minutes long. Uh, here's what you got going on. Your web quest design, um, signature um, assignment, your teacher interview is due in a couple weeks. And that's that. That's it. Any questions? No Kahoot tonight. Uh, for the um, for the teacher observation, you yes. had mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, due to the timing, it's okay if we just do the, the interview. Yes. Okay, great. Just yep. wanted to confirm. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Uh huh. And Angie, I got some more. Let me see. Hold on. Let me get out of my. I I have resources coming out of my ears. So let me pull up my little resource, my Brandman resource folder here. So I got the SAMR model, right? So there's that video. Um, Bloom's question stems. Here's another one. Like that. All right, that one goes on and on. I can share that one too. Um, the DOK wheel, DOK question stems. I like this one. A lot of my classrooms actually have these on the inside. And then Blooms, what's this one? Oh, I already had that's from the. Yeah, I will put these in the week five folder on Blackboard. I'll do it right this second so I don't forget. Actually, let me stop recording. I'm sure people don't want to.